Beautiful. Tonight I want to continue to share with you all from where we were a fortnight ago about change. And so again tonight, people change is the heading of my thoughts for us tonight. The power of biblical Christianity is people change. The power of biblical Christianity is people change. We change. I change. We change. It's not come to Christ and stay the same, but rather be transformed into his image and original intent. Coming to and following Christ is about, yes, the old hymn, just as I am. But then we allow his grace and love to transform us into his very image. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. The Bible is absolutely filled with people that had an encounter with Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, and they changed. Jesus was walking through Jericho. He was passing through Jericho. And there was a man by the name of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was just a little dude. But he'd heard about Jesus and he wanted to see him, but he was sure that Jesus wouldn't want to have anything to do with him. So what did Zacchaeus do? He climbed a tree, a sycamore tree, and then he could view this Messiah from a distance. The Bible actually says there that Jesus was passing through. And so what's beautiful about this account was that when Jesus got to the place where Zacchaeus was, he looked up and he said, Zach, come on down because I'm going to go to your house. That's all of our story. I was at an Easter camp once and Jesus stopped. He said, Glassy, what game are you playing? Come. I want to come to your house. And it was there that everything changed for me. And so as Jesus looked up and he saw Zacchaeus, he says, come on down, I want to go to your place. How many of you know that the whole community was right behind him? The Bible says in Luke in chapter 19, and when the people saw, they all muttered among themselves and complained that Jesus had gone to be the guest of a man who was devoted to sin, a sinner. So then Zacchaeus stood up. And solemnly declared to the Lord, See, Lord, the half of all my goods I now give to the poor, and if I have ripped anybody off, I will repay four times what I have taken. How many of you know that if a tax collector wants to repay you four times what he's stolen, that represents a changed life? What do you reckon? Zacchaeus changed and the word of God says there then that Jesus said to him today salvation has come not only to Zacchaeus but to his whole household biblical Christianity the good news the gospel is all about a changed life In John, in chapter 4, again, the Bible says that it was necessary for Jesus to go through Samaria. It's there that we find Jacob's well. 
Jesus was tired from a long journey. And the Bible says that he sat down at the well. And what happened? A woman came. And Jesus began to speak to her. He began to reach out. Because biblical Christianity is all about a life changing. This woman came to draw water in the middle of the day when nobody else was there. Jesus had sent his disciples off into the town to buy food. So Jesus was there and all knowing he knew this woman was also about to come. Jesus begins a dialogue with her and says, while you're there, can you draw water for me? Give me a drink. Going on from that, Jesus said to her, what? If you knew who I was, you would be asking me for a drink. Because if you just draw from that well, you'll be thirsty again. But if you draw from me, you will never thirst again. The account goes on and they started to talk about the Messiah. And Jesus was there and he says, Hello. The Messiah. I am the one. If you drink the water that I give, you will never thirst again. And she said, give me that water. Give me a drink of that water so that I will never thirst again. And Jesus says, yeah, okay, cool. Go and call your husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. No, you're right, you're telling the truth, but you had five, said Jesus, and the one you're with now is not your husband either. Amazing, amazing story. And it goes on in uh, John and chapter 4, let me read what happens. John chapter 4, verses 28. Then the woman left her water jar and went away to the town. And she began telling the people. How many of you already know that there's something's happened to this woman? Already, straight away, she left her jar a precious thing to her and went straight into the town and started talking to people about the Lord. Come and see a man who has told me everything that I have ever done. Is not this the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One? So the people left the town and set out to go to him. Biblical Christianity is all about lives changing. It's about people changing. On our recent camp, we spent quite a lot of time each night, in fact, talking about a changed life. I have not been able to shape that story, and nor do I want to. And so in Luke, we find the most beautiful, again, story of a changed life. The setting is this. It was Passover. And Yeshua, Jesus, knowing that Gethsemane was ahead of him, that word means the place of the press, was just ahead of him. He says to the disciples, I have been really hanging out to have Passover with you before I suffer. Imagine this day. There's Jesus with the disciples around him.
having a meal. And Jesus knows that the cross is just right there. That was the setting that he's talking to these guys. He then goes on and says, one of you will betray me. And with that, each of them started to look and whisper, is it me? Who? Who's going to betray the Lord? In Luke chapter 22 and verse 31, Jesus goes on right after that and says, Peter, Satan has asked that you will be given up to him that he might sift you like grain. Listen to this. But I, I have prayed for you, Peter. How beautiful is that? I've been praying for you, Peter, that your faith will not fail. That your faith will not fail. And when you yourself have turned again, strengthen and establish your brethren. Jesus is saying there to Peter that there's going to be some stuff up ahead. But I want you to know I'm praying for you that your faith won't fail. And that I will use your success and your failures to bless others. I will use the good things and the bad things to uh, empower and strengthen and establish others. And Peter said to the Lord, we know it so well, I'm ready to go with you to both prison and to the dead. So do you have typical Peter's just right out there all the time? And so God's just saying, hey, listen, you might have some tough times, but I'm praying that your faith won't fail. Your faith won't fail. And what is Peter's response? God, I'm with you. I'm in there. Prison, death, whatever comes, I won't fail you. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, before a single cock shall crow this day, you will deny me three times. Wow. The account goes on. And while Jesus is talking to his disciples, a crowd begins to come over. And Judas comes up to kiss Jesus in betrayal. And the account continues in Luke 22, in verse 54. When they had seized Jesus and led him away, bringing him into the house of the high priest, Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and were seated together, Peter sat among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the firelight and gazing intently at him, said, This man was with him too. But he denied it and said, Woman, I do not know him. And a little while later, somebody else saw him and said, You are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And when about an hour more had passed, still another insisted, It is the truth that this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And instantly, while he was still talking, the cock crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter recalled the Lord's words, how he was told before the cock crows today, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. What an 
account. Here's Peter with every good intention. Here's Peter that had, in his heart had always loved the Lord and had given up so much to be a disciple of Christ. Yet here we find Peter now weeping bitterly. He's denied Christ three times. Just a few moments earlier, he was saying, I'll go with you to jail and to prison. And now, already, in such a short time, Peter's denied Christ. I know about you, every January I start on the first bus, I'm going to lose some weight. Intentions, aren't we? Like, you know, we, we've got all the best plans, and three minutes into it, I'm eating all the wrong things. Peter had just said, I will, I will die for you. And moments later, just before Peter was saying, Jesus was saying to Peter, I'm praying that your faith won't fail. And then we find Peter denying Christ and weeping bitterly. I reckon Peter thought he'd blown it. Particularly with men as we were on this men's camp, so many times men can, when it all hits the fan, they just think, it's all just gone too far. This situation with my wife has gone too far. It's unredeemable. I'm a failure. I don't know what to do. So many times we, we self-disqualify ourselves because of a moral issue, because of a financial issue, because of a decision that we made, because of something that we said because of unforgiveness that we haven't offered to others, because we were able to do good and we never do, and all of those things, and we end up like Peter, weeping bitterly because we feel that we're a failure. We think that everything's gone too far. But the truth is, Biblical Christianity is about changing lives. That's what Jesus is all about, changing our lives. One of the great hindrances to our walk is we bash ourselves up. We think that we've gone too far. We think, how can God love somebody like me. But the truth is, he loves us incredibly. For neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. What a beautiful promise to hang on to. I don't know what sort of a week you've had. I don't know what sort of a year you've had. But I know from experience it doesn't take much sometimes when we really come down on ourselves. I want to remind you that there is nothing that will ever separate us from His love. Nothing will separate us from His life. I reckon Peter, as he's weeping bitterly, was feeling like there was nothing that would be able to redeem the situation that he was in. This beautiful account goes on. 
Jesus has been crucified. And in Mark chapter 16 and verses 1 to 7, the account continues. So Christ has been crucified. And this is what happens. Mary, it says, when, in Matthew 16, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, which makes Mary the mother of Jesus as well, and Salome purchased sweet smelling spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus' body. And very early, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb. And as they were going, they began to say to each other, Who will roll away the stone? They were chatting on their way to anoint the body. And as they got right to the tomb, they noticed that the stone had been rolled away. And seated right where Jesus had lay was an angel, all dressed in white. And the angel says here in verse 7, so beautiful, he says, I know that you are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified and has risen. He's not here. See the place where he lay? Be gone and tell the disciples and Peter. Don't you just love that? So here's Peter who had denied Christ, felt like he'd, he'd burned all of his bridges, felt like there was no way that he could return. And here the angel says, go and tell the disciples, Jesus is risen, the tomb's empty, he's not here, go and tell
Bible says he put on his garment and he jumped into the drink and began to swim to Christ. Peter put on his garment. He put on the call of which God had called him to. He put on his gifting. That was the gift of God. He responded again in a really beautiful way and said yes to the things of God in his own heart. And so when he heard that Jesus was on the beach, he put on his garment and swam to the beach. And while he was there, the Bible says there, so Peter went aboard out there, so he went, he swam forward, and then Jesus says, you know, where's the fish? And Jesus said to them then, come and have breakfast with me. I don't know if you've missed something here, but this Jesus who said, come and have breakfast with me, is the resurrected Lord. He's the death-conquering King. This is the risen Messiah. Not one mention, not one 
mention of how he denied Christ. I just love that. I know you're all prom and proper, but I reckon I'd have a bit of a list <laughs> of things that he want to talk to me about, but not, not one word. Not one word of why did you deny me? Not, not one word about what sort of a leader do you think you are? Not, not one word about that. I reckon that's the best news I've heard in a long time. Yeah, that's right. Not one word of where I failed. This resurrected Christ just said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, yeah, I love you. Cool. Because that's all I need. That's all I need, Margo. Just love me. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? How many times in all the fights between husbands and wives and churches and all the crap that goes on, that we say, you do this and you did that and you hurt me, none of that. Jesus just said, Pete, I reckon you've learned some stuff. Do you love me? Yeah, I love you more. Then feed my sheep. Mm -hmm. The Bible goes on and it says that he asked him a second time, Peter, do you have the pain? Do you love me unconditionally with the God kind of love? And Peter said, Lord, I love you as a brother. Because up until this point, Peter had always over, over uh, exaggerated and underachieved. He was going to prison and to death with the Lord and didn't do any of it. I reckon Peter's learned some stuff. And Jesus didn't challenge him, he just said, okay, tend, tend my ship. The third time he said, Peter, do you love me with the God kind of love, unconditional love? Oh, Jesus, why did you have to ask me again? Why did you, you, you know everything, Peter said. Lord, you know that I love you with the brother kind of love. Peter's humbled and he under promises with the hope of over delivering. I think it's beautiful. What a beautiful story. That could be each of our story. Paul, do you love me? Oh God, you know that I love you and I try every day. You know, it reminds me of that old story. You know, this person, he says you know, to the Lord, I'm so sure I've had the best day. Everything's gone right. I haven't said one negative thing. I haven't even had a negative thought. Oh Lord, this day is just awesome. But Lord, I'm about to get out of bed. <laughs> And anything could happen. <laughs> so help me now. I think that's just so beautiful. And so Jesus again commissions him to feed his sheep. How many of you know Peter is changing? I said a couple of weeks ago, if one number changes in a mathematical equation, if just one number changes, we get a totally different result. That's why change is so important. We can either fight each other and fight our spouse or fight out in our job or fight and fight and fight, or we can do the only thing that I can do, and that is I change. I change, we're going to get a totally different result. And the Bible is all about people 
changing. God's pursuing love and acceptance, along with his empowering Holy Spirit, has brought new transforming life to Peter. You see, Peter's story doesn't end there. It goes on. And in chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all assembled together in one place. Why were they all there together in one place? Because they were there in Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost, the feast of Pentecost. And so they were all there together when suddenly there came the sound from heaven like the rushing of violent wind. We know in verse 4 it says, and they were all filled with the set-apart Holy Spirit. It goes on. And there was a bit of a kerfuffle happening in the town. And in verse 14 of Acts in chapter 2, guess who stands up? Somebody who's had their life changed. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. I just so love that. And it concludes in Acts in chapter 2. And Peter answered them, repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise of the Holy Spirit is to and for you and your children and to and for all those who are far away. Therefore those who accepted and welcomed his message were baptised and there was added that day 3,000 souls. What an amazing story of life of a life being changed. Tonight, God wants to use our failures and our successes to strengthen others. He doesn't bring up our past failures, but rather He uses them to make us. Tonight, it doesn't matter our past, whether we feel like Zacchaeus or the woman at the well or Peter, if we come to him, he'll change us. What a beautiful promise. The other thing I loved as I was just meditating over this passage of scripture, Jesus also told Peter how he was going to die. But this time, Peter's response was not now a reaction of violence, but rather Peter's desire was to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and to be acquainted with his sufferings as to be continually transformed into Christ's likeness. Peter is a changed person. That's the power of our resurrected Messiah. That's the power of the gospel. That's why today the preaching of the gospel is so important because it's Christ and Him alone that will change a life. And I reckon we need more lives changed. I also hold this in the context of what I did a fortnight ago, that our world is changing so fast. So many things are changing. What's our reaction to all of that stuff? To chop somebody's ear off? Or to be like Peter, and allow it to bring us into Christ's presence that we are transformed. Where we become like Paul, where he says, I've learned the secret of being content. That in all things, it's Christ that strengthens me. I hope that 
this COVID crisis and the many things that will come in the future, I pray that all of them will push us into his transforming grace and love and power so that we won't walk in the natural, but that we will walk in the spirit. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace that transforms us. Father, thank you that we read in your word the true stories of how lives change. Some of us might be feeling like the people that we've talked about tonight that just felt like they're not good enough. But you never condemned. You only loved them and changed them. Father, tonight we pray that you change me. Father, my hand's up and says, God can continue to change me. Lord, when I'm confronted with tough stuff, change me. In my marriage, when I would love just to hope that others will change, that my spouse will change, my hand's up and says, change me. In that difficult relationship where I'm wanting somebody else to change, my hand's up and says, God, change me. In my attitudes and, and in, in my thinking, my hand's up and says, change me. Let me be transformed into the very image of God. That I would do things and think the way you think that I will be part of the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. And so, Father, for each of us tonight, we simply do it as Peter did it and so many others, where they were filled with the precious Holy Spirit that empowers us to walk in the Spirit. We welcome your Holy Spirit into our lives. We welcome your work and your goodness into our lives so that we change. Father, bless this church. I pray that in each of our own ways that we would simply uh, respond by saying yes to you. Yes to your transforming power. God bless you, church. We love you. I wish we could offer you a tea or a coffee and supper and all those sorts of things, but not yet. The time will come. Feel free just to talk to others. Share something that you may have got out of the words tonight. Feel free uh, with a 1.5 distance between you to pray for each other and encourage each other in the goodness of God and uh, just share something.